Hello, my name is Neil Hansen. I'm an anesthesiologist at the Virginia Mason Medical Center, and today we'll be talking about ultrasound identification of the dorsal scapular nerve and the long thoracic nerve during interscaling block. I have no financial disclosures uh, at this time, and I hope that by the end of the lecture, uh, we'll be able to, well, you'll be able to understand the anatomical origins of the dorsal scapular nerve and the long thoracic nerves, and actually try to use this lecture as a platform uh, to reiterate how important anatomical understanding is uh, during ultrasound-guided regional anesthesia. And that ultrasound hasn't absolved us of our um, responsibility to continue and maintain our understanding on anatomy, but rather it should um, push us forward and uh, make sure that we are uh, still keeping abreast of that information as well. So let's, uh, let's begin with the an anatomy of the cervical triangle. You are probably all very familiar with this view. Um, I like to reiterate its importance, at least in the interscaling uh, nerve block. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit historically about what approaches um, were done at the, prior to the use of ultrasound. So as you can see here, um, this is an image of the brachial plexus, the C5, 6, 7, and 8 nerve roots. Um, the middle scalene muscle and the anterior scalene muscle sandwich the brachial plexus together. And at the upper trunks, you can see the takeoff of the super uh, scapular nerve. Um, directly uh, beside that uh, brachial plexus, near the clavicle, is the subclavian artery. And then you can see here, running anteriorly to the uh, anterior scalene muscle is the phrenic nerve. Now, historically, the approach to the brachial plexus, at least when we performed interscalene blocks, was above the C5 nerve root um, into the interscalene groove, or that groove between the scalene muscles. And you can imagine um, a little trajectory anteriorly, and uh, you'd be very close to the phrenic nerve, which is why uh, the phrenic nerve is uh, blocked 100% of the time using this technique and, of course, using ultrasound as well. Um, and then even a little bit more anterior to that, and um, there's some vascular structures as, as well. Uh, posterior to that, if, he, if uh, this is uh, prior to nerve stim, there wasn't much issue, um, at least you had to worry about. But with nerve stimulation, uh, you could stimulate the dorsal scapular nerve, and that was a uh, metric for you to redirect medially because you were too far laterally into the middle scalene muscle. Now, when ultrasound became popular, um, uh, what we did was take a supraclavicular approach and trace the brachial plexus up to the inner scalene groove where uh, traditionally that block was performed. Um, and what happened at that point was that our approach to the inner scalene block changed completely, um, whereas we had a, a fairly anterior approach, um, at least in the insertion site. Uh, now we had a very posterior approach. And the reasons for that were probably threefold. Um, one, it was an in-plane technique, so you could see the entire length of the needle while you were working. And we felt that that was a more safe way of performing the regional technique. Because in addition to our target, we could also see the tip and the shaft of the needle and what adjacent structures it went through to get to the brachial plexus. Um, we were further away from the neuroaxis and major vascular structures by taking this posterior approach. There was no risk of damaging the phrenic nerve when we uh, did it this way. And again, we avoided the internal jugular carotid arteries um, as we would if we had taken an anterior approach. And then finally, uh, because of the distance we took through the muscles and uh, the various other various other tissues, we were able to put more catheter length, um, or rather redundant catheter length, into the middle scalene muscle, which uh, allowed for a little bit of leeway uh, when the patient moved um, and the catheter tip was secured. So with these three advantages, uh, the posterior approach using ultrasound became much more popular. Um, and Generally, uh, most anesthesiologists tended to shy away from the out-of-plane technique, um, mainly because the uh, amount of catheter they could insert uh, and keep the tip exactly where they wanted it near the brachial plexus wasn't, wasn't always sufficient to keep the catheter secure um, after um, placement of the interscaling brachial plexus nerve block. 
So the posterior approach sounds great, and again, we avoid all those major structures we talked about. The problem or the issue that um, we encounter is that, in fact, if we read up on our anatomy and remember that, in fact, the dorsal scapular nerve and the long thoracic nerves are in, in the way of the needle, effectively. Uh, the, classically speaking, the dorsal scapular nerve um, traditionally was believed to come off the C5 nerve root. Uh, and the long thoracic nerve was believed to originate from contributions of the C5, C6, and C7 nerve. The suprascapular nerve obviously is in, kind of came off the upper trunks a little bit later or more distally in the brachial plexus and unlikely to be an issue um, when performing the interscaling block itself. But if your trajectory of your needle is as such, you can imagine that in theory you will potentially pass nearby or through or adjacent to the dorsal scapula or long thoracic nerve. So with ultrasound, we have to remember that although hyperechoic structures may appear to be uh, neural tissue, there's little way for us to know, in fact, without testing. Um, and you can see here, this is an image of the classic interscaling uh, brachial plexus nerve block. Here's the uh, anterior scalene muscle, the middle scalene muscle. This is the C5, C6, C7 nerve roots. And then here, um, here is potentially what could be neural structure. Um, you know, we are more discerning. Uh, our probes are higher frequency than they used to be, so we're able to pick up more uh, difference in tissue, tissue planes than we did before. So uh, myself and a colleague of mine, David Aoyoung, wanted to investigate whether or not um, nerves were in the path of this classic approach to the interscaling block. And what we did was we took uh, 50 volunteers who were going to undergo shoulder surgery that would require continuous brachial plexus block at the interscaling groove. And what we did is we scanned their brachial plexus and discerned whether or not we could see something that we identified on ultrasound that could potentially be a nerve. Now, there were two of us there to verify whether or not we thought there was neural tissue. And then afterwards, we would stimulate the area in question to see if we would get contraction within the um, within the musculature of uh, innervation of either the dorsal scapula or the long thoracic nerves. So um, our questions were, could we see it with ultrasound? What was its origin in terms of uh, nerve root? How far away was it from the brachial plexus? And then finally, if stimulated, what muscles contracted that were non-plexus muscles? So Every time we stimulated, we made sure that we weren't getting a brachial plexus innervation and only muscles that would be innervated by those two nerves. Um, and what we, what we found was actually quite surprising. Here is a demographic or baseline demographic table for the patients that we did see. Um, effectively, probably evenly distributed between males and females, approximately 58 years of age. and. Uh, a somewhat bell-shaped curve in the ASA physical class status, as well as uh, a fairly reasonable BMI uh, on average between our patients. You can see here in this picture, um, we took stimulating two E's to those structures that we felt were neural tissue, um, and then we directly palpated the rhomboid levator scapula as well as the serratus anterior muscles. So, you have to remember what muscles are innervated by which nerve in order for this to make sense. So the dorsal scapular nerve innervates the rhomboid and the levator scapulae muscles. And the rhomboid muscles, when they contract, they move the um, scapula directly medially. Um, whereas if the levator scapulae is innervated, then it pulls the um, scapula medially and superiorly, or cephalad. Uh, the long thoracic nerve actually innervates the serratus anterior muscle, which pronates the shoulder and kind of moves the scapula outward and upward. So it's typically referred to as the boxer's muscle because of sort of the um, motions that a boxer would have to make in the ring uh, with a jab. So if any of those contractions occurred, then we would know exactly which nerve was stimulated. So um, what we discovered was that uh, approximately at the level of the C6 nerve root um, which was where most of these nerves ended up being. 
um, relatively speaking. So in absolute terms, it was approximately one centimeter from the skin. But a more useful metric for understanding is at the near the C6 nerve root, that's where most of these nerves ended up being. And they were less than a centimeter posterior to the brachial plexus. So effectively, directly in the path of the needle, uh, for typically most of these posterior approach ultrasound guided inner scanning blocks. Now we were only able to see 48 of the 50 um, patients, in, in 48 of the 50 patients, we were only able to see um, uh, nerves, what we thought potentially might be nerves that ended up, we, we ended up stimulating. So about 90% of the time, we were able to see the nerve effectively. Uh, in one case, we, we did not see the nerve at all, but by direct stimulation, we were able to get contraction of the um, uh, rhomboid muscles. So, so effectively, only one time out of 50, we were unable to see anything, and we got no contraction whatsoever when we directly stimulated inside the middle scaling muscle. So uh, you can see here that's sort of signified by this table down uh, at the bottom. Uh, in the case of the dorsal scapular nerve, uh, we got 40 patients visible, um, well, 40 patients we saw the dorsal scapular nerve in, um, and verified by stimulation as well. And then in one case, we stimulated the dorsal scapular nerve without actually seeing it. So effectively, 77% of the time, if you see something in the middle scaling muscle, it's probably the dorsal scapular nerve, and about 23% of the time uh, from this observational study, uh, it's probably the long thoracic nerve. There was a small subset of patients, actually, where we saw both the dorsal scapular and the lung thoracic nerves, but that was a pretty small population. This uh, is a graph sort of depicting the nerve root origins of each of these nerves that we saw. So in addition to actually verifying that we would see them on ultrasound and then stimulate them, we would also trace them back up to their um, cervical foramen and see in which cases or where uh, these nerves originated from. Um, you can see that there are two colors, the long thoracic and the dorsal scapular, and then um, kind of in each of these scenarios you can see kind of the percentages of how, how often you would see, um, for instance, in the C5 region, most likely uh, this, is a, this is where most of the dorsal scapular nerve originates from. In one case we had it at C4, and then a few times they were both, inter, uh, they were both originating from the C5 and C6, uh, they had contributions from both the C5 and C6 nerve roots. Uh, and here, the uh, long thoracic nerve seemed to appear to be more uh, originating from the C6 nerve root. And this is just a, another depiction of what we were seeing. Uh, you can see here, this is the uh, transverse process of the C6 uh, nerve root here again. And then this is the nerve origin coming off the C6 nerve root. So in addition to seeing it, where we would typically put the block, we also scan the patient to trace it back up to its um, origin, and then we stimulate it to verify which nerve it was. So why do we care about that? Well, shortly after publishing this um, concern of ours, we felt that um, patients were at risk of getting injured uh, in, in the placement of these pretty common blocks. And so we, in our discussion, mainly we talked about um, potential hazards of uh, injury to the dorsal scapular or the uh, long thoracic nerves. And shortly after that, there's a, actually a publication at ASRA this year about an individual who, was, um, who had long thoracic nerve injury after inner scanning block. This is a case report of a 59-year-old female who was getting a rotator cuff repair. Um, she had a very minimal past, uh, significant past medical history, and she got an inner scaling ambulatory perineal catheter for three days for pain after uh, for analgesia uh, following her shoulder surgery. But two weeks afterward, um, she came to follow up and she had unilateral scapular winging. And then this was confirmed by EMG that she in fact had neuropathy of the long thoracic nerve. And it was, it was uh, quite a long and protracted uh, recovery process. They expected 24 months, but this was only after two months of intense physical therapy. And the injury was fairly debilitating to her day-to-day -day life. What we learned from our research project, uh, once completing it, it, was that we need to be, well, we need to give more emphasis on um, anatomical education while, while educating our residents in ultrasound guided regional blocks, or even our colleagues, um, and that uh, we should be cognizant of how 
Um, all of these adjacent structures that we pass through um, can be injured and damaged.